that was it was it was it was a fascinating case. It was really an interesting case. This guy was accused of raping a twelve year old who was the daughter of the family he was living with in Springfield. He lived on the side of the tracks in Springfield. Of course he claimed that he didn't do all this stuff. He took a lot of detective tests. I had to take a polygraph. Which he passed, which forever destroyed my faith in polygraphs. <laughs> The, uh, but, you know, what was sad about it was that the prosecutors had evidence, among which was his underwear. His what? His underwear, his underwear which was bloody. Sat down at the crime lab for those efforts to form the crime lab. Crime lab took a pair of underpants, neatly cut out the part that they were going to test, Tested it, came back with the result of what kind of blood it was, what was mixed in with it. Then sent the pants back with the hole in it for evidence. So I got an order to see the evidence, and the prosecutor didn't want me to see the evidence. I had to go to Moffitt Cummings and convince Moffitt that, yes, indeed, I had a right to see the evidence before it was presented. So they presented these other pants with a hole in it. I said, what kind of evidence is that? You know, you've got a pair of other pants with a hole in it. Of course, the crime lab had thrown away oh, the piece that they cut out. It was really, long. I mean, I plea bargained it down because they didn't have any, it turned out they didn't have any So he would analyze blood stains if he got interested in a case. And so the sort of the story from the grapevine was if he would get them interested in the case, then, you know, you had the foremost expert in the world willing to testify, assuming that it came out the way you wanted it to come out. And he sat at his little desk. And I pulled out my underpants, you know, and gave them to him and started analyzing, looking at the fibers, you know, with magnifying glass and all that stuff. And you can't, you know, you can't prove anything. You, know, you can't even you know, so I can see a slight trace that it wouldn't be enough to test and all that. Uh, I looked back told Malin Gibson that I had, well, I probably can't remember the man's name, but I cut out who's who and I've done all this stuff and I handed it to Malin Gibson. I said, well, I'm this guy's ready to come from New York and read this miscarriage of justice. <laughs> So we, we were going to plea bargain, so I went before Moffitt Cummings to present the plea. And Moffitt said, what, what, what is this? And you know, first degree rape. And, uh, but, you know, he dropped it in the charge of dropping it. I can't remember something like five or something. So Moffitt had to, you know, under you know, the law, he was supposed to determine whether the plea was factually supported. Moffat asked me to leave the room while he examined my client oh, so that he could find out his facts. Of course, I said, Judge, I can't leave the room. I'm his lawyer. So I know, but I don't want to talk about this. Oh, God. Really? Yeah. So that was Moffat. He had a lot of fun with Moffat. But anyway, that, I did some of that. How, how did it turn out? Oh, he play bargain. He got him off. He was time served in the county jail. He'd been in the county jail about two months. 